we're now going to move on to the second part of our uh, today's webinar in which we will have Chantal Esquivias and Lucia Rubio presenting to us on reimagining language learning through PBLL. So maybe some of the people who had questions can now see an example of project-based learning in action in our domain. Uh, Chantal and Lucia's project was recently published in The Language Educator. If you didn't get a chance to see the issue of The Language Educator, which is Actful's uh, smaller journal of uh, sort of daily practice. Uh, it's a very interesting article. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome, and thank you for your participation in this webinar. We are very excited to share with you all the PBLL that we have created. My name is Lucia Rubio from the University of Utah, and I will be presenting with my colleague Chantal Esquivias from Weber State University. Mm, this was our first experience with PBLL, and this is the badge that we received for our participation. The course that we took last year was organized by the National Foreign Language Research Center, that is a Title VI center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education. Our PBLL was implemented in three different high schools in Utah. Students in these three high schools belong to the Dual Immersion Bridge program and have taken an AP exam and most of them have received the grade of three or above. The bridge program offers three university level courses and last year's course was Spanish 3116 or pop culture in the Spanish speaking world. The last unit of this course was about visual arts and we decided to implement the PBLL in that unit. Before we talk about the project we are going to review what the PBLL definition is. So PBLL is project-based learning and is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. One of the key elements of the PBLL is the authenticity that we saw in the previous presentation, and we tried to make our project a the most authentic we could. So we were aiming for the fully authentic um, project. We would like to give you a brief overview of our project. Back in 2016, a Mexican restaurant in West Jordan, Utah, displayed murals of their, in their outside walls. The murals were painted by students from a local charter school for their art classes with their, teacher, uh, with their art teacher, Miguel Galas. When some neighbors saw the designs, they mistook them for gang-related icons and complained to the city. City officials decided that according to the city ordinances, it violated the city code and imposed elevated fines to the owner of the restaurant and told him to, remove, to cover them up. The community, mainly Spanish-speaking community, mobilized and decided to fight for the mural as its designs were rep representing Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, icons for the fight for social justice within the Latino community in the U.S. So here you see the two channels uh, in Utah, Channel 2 News and KSL, and both of them had like articles and uh, news about the, the murals displayed in the restaurant. And here you can see the taqueria during 2015 with all the murals. And although under the word taqueria, you can see that part of it was already covered with red paint. And I, I, I'm going to use the, um, the arrow to point. Like this was a mural under the, um, the red that you see. So the, it was already covered. This is Miguel Galat, that is the artist who painted the murals with his um, students from the art class. And you see the, the Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. And this is the mural that stayed for longer, but now is, has been removed. Later in 2016, using Google Maps, we found this photo with most of the front of the murals painted over. Uh, only partially you can see that um, there were some two little murals like the remain in the side. But if you see in the next screen, 
Uh, this is how the taqueria looks today in 2017, having lost all the murals that once decorated the walls in, of the taqueria. The owner had to move his business to a different city, Kerns, due to the harassment he suffered during the whole process. And you see the new restaurant, and uh, this is the wall the owner is thinking about using for like a new mural. Mm, so the blueprint uh, that you need to use for the PBLL starts always with a challenging problem or question that has to be 50 words maximum. Our, our challenging question was, how can we bring together a multicultural community through a public display of art, a mural, and raise cultural awareness? So, so uh, the blueprint, um, if you take the PBLL course, the blueprint is the central document that you will need to follow. And ours ended being 34 pages long. So it's very detailed and with a lot of information about your project. Um, all the projects that we test and um, all the projects that you prepare for the PBLL have to test their ideas and they all use the product square. And this is an example of the pro product square where you have the problem with the question or challenge, the purpose, the product, the audience, and what do, why do kids care? And this is how we completed, how we answer all those questions. As you can see, the purpose of our PBLL um, was to engage students in a project that would develop their cultural awareness through the creation of an art project for a community business. And why do learners care? This project, our project, would bring the current community together. Juan Dominguez, the owner, had to move his business to another town in Utah because his, the mural displayed outside his original restaurant was not well understood and accepted. Now, with the help of the local Anglo community and the Hispanic community, the mural will be displayed as a reflection of the blending of these two communities, these two heritages. And now I'm going to uh, let Chantal continue. continue. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, now that you know a little bit what was our uh, challenge for this project, our entry event or how it was referred to in the in the previous presentation as the hook or the launch of this uh, five week long PBLL was this um, task one in day one. So um, remember that PBLL it's all about the students motivation. So the first day learners started with a hands-on activity that made them realize that symbols depending on the context that they are found in time, space, can be interpreted in many different ways. Context and information are everything when interpreting symbols. One of the activities goal was also to make them realize that if you don't know about something, you can't judge it. You need to be informed in order for you to make a judgment. So students were given a um, Mm, first, these cards, so these images that you have here that says image card, image card, they were all cut out cards, and uh, some of them had images and other ones had written information, very basic written information, as you see in the screen, but all of the information was in, in Spanish. All of this PBLL, PBLL was conducted in Spanish, but we translated it so you can uh, understand the information. So students had to match with their partners the images with the information. For example, they got the image of a swastika, the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe, and some of the Nazarenos that are typical from the Holy Week, Semana Santa in Spain. And then they got the information in the, in the cards was very basic, the written one, and it was related to the images. Then they were given a second set of cards. They had to match them. And then once they had matched them and talked to their partners why, why they matched the swastika with the Second World War um, card, then they were given a second set of cards that offered a very different context for the same images. For example, they were given a card with a picture of a Roman mosaic from the second century AD that had an swastika. Uh, they were also given a 1970s interpretation of the Virgen de Guadalupe that represented the liberation of the Chicano women in the US. 
And then they were given um, the image of the Holy Week in Spain, but with a different situation. They said, okay, what if this image is associated with the 1900s in Southern US? So then the context changed completely the idea of what the image would, um, would mean. And students were invited to reflect in groups, how did the change of context of these images change the way they saw and perceived these images? Our goal for this task one on day one was for the students to realize that context and information is everything when interpreting symbols. And that first impressions don't always matter. This activity was directly related to our case study where the mural painted outside the Taqueria Azteca de Oro was misinterpreted by some members of the community. They thought they belonged to gang members of the area and it brought very negative consequences at many levels. That very same day, because the classes last an hour and a half, we developed a task two um, a activity for the students. So the students were given many cutout images and a blank posters. And first learners were asked to organize the images in what they thought was a coherent chronological sequence. They had to discuss with the members of the group what were their predictions about what had happened in that place. And to give you an idea, example of what these images uh, look like. You have here some, they are all cut out from the news reports that were online and they show the taqueria, they show the art teacher, they show the, the image of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, West Jordan, Utah, so they had a place to, to link this uh, news. Um, and here you have a few more images where they could see that it was the city council members of West Jordan together, some news reporters, what it seemed like demonstrations outside the taqueria, but they were not given any, any text, only images. And they had to create a timeline in the, in the poster of predicting what they thought what had happened in that place. And as a coincidence or lucky for us, while we were doing this activity in Olympus High School in Grand District, one student raised his hand and he said, oh, but Senora Esquivias, this lady that is in this image, she is Gabby's mom. And Gabby was a student in that class. So we were very, very lucky to actually have the, um, the, the presence of her in the, during the interviews that later the students did. So it was a great uh, coincidence. Uh, so then, once the students had put all the images together in their timeline, they had to uh, prepare brief presentations and give them to the class of um, whatever they thought had happened in the place. During their presentations, they were required to use the vocabulary, a lot of it art vocabulary and law vocabulary in relation to the city, city laws, uh, that we thought was useful to, throughout this whole project. This vocabulary was provided in flashcards with the word, a short definition, and an example with the word in context, all of it again in the target language, and if possible, an image. By doing this activity, we introduced during our first class not only the topic of our project, but also we scaffolded some of the useful vocabulary. In the end, the instructors projected on a PowerPoint, the correct sequence of events, and narrated for the students the real story of what had happened in Taqueria del Oro. As you may remember from the beginning of this presentation, we wanted this project to be fully authentic. Therefore, we arranged for the key people in the project to be interviewed by the students. We scaffolded the process from beginning to end. And you might recognize in one of these images, Cristina Flores, Gabby's mom, the news reporter from Channel 2. She was one of our guests. First, we wanted the students to access and use all the online, uh, online authentic resources in relation to this event back in 2015, such as the newspaper clippings and the news reports. The students use this information to build their background information to prepare their interviews with the guest speakers and to create the artistic component of the final product um, of this project, which was a mural art proposal. The first task in the scaffolding process was using the interpretive mode of communication to read 
all of the material available about this event and answer some questions. So we, we the teachers, could do a quick check for understanding among the students about the main events and timeline. Each student wrote a postcard to a friend or a family member summarizing the events they had just learned about. That's two of the scaffolding process for the preparing the actual interview students in their groups practice how to greet their guests what type of questions they could ask how to address the interviewees and how to end an interview and here you have an example in it's a, a copy of the worksheet that the students got in spanish and it's basically scaffolding all the process of the interview interview so they would be ready when the real uh, interviewees came to our classes. Practicing the interpersonal mode of communication, students go to interview in the target language. First, Miguel Galaz, the art teacher and artist that together with his students painted the original mural at Taqueria de Loro in West Jordan. Then they got to interview Cristina Flores, Gabby's mom, the news reporter from Channel 2 who reported back in 2015 about this event. And finally, they were able to interview Chris McConaughey, who served his mission in Dominican Republic, so he spoke Spanish and was back in 2015 and still is today a council member of the city of West Jordan. So he represented more of the point of view of the city during uh, his interview. So they were, we were very lucky to have three key um, people in this whole process, and all of them Spanish speaking. Okay, so uh, what were our final products? We had three final products. The first one was the mural art proposal that was um, to be displayed outside the Mexican uh, restaurant, the Azteca de Oro. The, is, this is the new restaurant where the owner of the old Taqueria del Oro needed, needed to move in Kearns. Then students had to do a tri-fold brochure that would be distributed at the market and explains what is represented in the mural that was going to be outside. So if you go to the market to buy something, you can get a brochure and it gives you a short explanation of the mural outside the walls and why the mural came to be. And then a children's activity that is related to the mural. So here you can see uh, one of the examples that we have of the three, the poster uh, with the art display, we have the trifold brochure, and then we have the children's activity with the same topic and then using the same uh, picture. Mm, uh, in this one, you can see how like the walls outside the new restaurant and uh, what the owner of the restaurant wanted, where the owner of the restaurant wanted the new mural to be. He was going to apply for a permit, so he, we don't know if, if he's going to get them, but this is the place where he wanted to have the new murals. Here you can see all the students working on their um, uh, murals and our project. And as you can see, it's not only that they have to draw something, they have to find elements of the Hispanic community that could um, explain um, their culture or their um, ideas something that it can bring the community together. So the different groups had very different ideas. In this one, for example, was very interesting because they used the, the, the Aztec calendar, the symbol of the Aztec calendar, but inside of it, they place a modern Hispanic famous people, like a baseball player, a lucha libre fighter. So they were um, combining the two um, cultures, the modern uh, Hispanic culture and the, and the pre-Columbian pre Hispanic culture. So this was a, a very interesting design that they chose. Here you can see the trifold displays, some of, some of the examples. They were very, very well done and very, like the research was very good. Uh, as you can, uh, in all of our um, presentation, we are trying to um, remind you that we are always using the three modes of communication. So when uh, students did their presentations in front of the our teacher or the news reporter, they use the presentational mode of communication. And here is an, an example of their presentation. Mm, for the presentational um, um, mode of communication, we use the actual um, rubric 
And the, uh, this is exactly the rubric that we use for to grade the students and to grade the presentations. Mm, here you can see more of the, um, the murals and you see Miguel Galaf uh, with the students, that the artist. He, at the beginning, we thought that he was going to choose the best um, art to be displayed at the at the uh, like uh, the outside of the restaurant, but then uh, at the end he said that uh, he was going to try he was going to try to create a mural that combines all the different art displays uh, prepared by the students. So everything is going to be uh, painted outside the walls of the restaurant. And here is Miguel Galaz giving the feedback. He was extraordinary, like the way he talked to the students. He, he commented on the art, the history, the, um, the colors they use, but also the culture, how this project is bringing communities together. It was very impressive. I think students really like having him in the classrooms. And he, um, he spent so much time with the students that we are always grateful to him. And as we said before, uh, the three modes of communication were always present, uh, present at the um, uh, PBLL, our, our, our PBLL listening, speaking, reading, writing, also like were part of uh, our project. For the PBLL, we had to use um, 21st century skills, and these are the ones that uh, were more present in our project. There are more than you can use, but these are, uh, this is a su summary of the skills that we um, used more in our design. And as, um, our presenter said before, uh, our article was published in the uh, Language Educator, and this is um, a copy of like the first page where you see part of the mural and you see some of the students who painted the mural, uh, the first mural. Um, and uh, finally, the taking, we want to take this PBLL to the next level. Last year, when we finished the class, we had the art proposals, the, we had the, the trifle brochures, we have the children's activity that was supposed to be um, distributed in the market so children could come out of the market, look at the wall and uh, do the different activities looking at the images that were represented. But uh, in the end, we're not sure if that wall is going to be available. So we are talking to different city members to see if we can find a, a, a city wall and um, be able to display the different designs of, uh, that the, all the students created last year. Because as Miguel Gala said, it would be great if instead of just choosing one winner, if we could combine them all and create a very large mural representing the, the Spanish-speaking community in, in Utah. And this is um, our last slide. We don't know if people have questions. This is Stephen. Thank you very much for that presentation. It's so great to have a, a, a look straight from the source at the project that inspired the article in the Language Educator. Uh, the chat has been fairly lively with comments and questions. One very popular question, uh, I'm not sure if you want to jump in and address this, is okay, the examples that we've seen today are all very well and good, but the students who are doing them are fairly advanced. How do you do PBLL at the novice level? I actually remember from last year when we were doing the online institute that that question came up a lot. Uh, how do you, and I think it's through the, the scaffolding and choosing probably projects that are, um, for example, this one had art involved in it and then it had the law, the city law. So I think I would never, you, you have to look for an appropriate eight project and not only age, but um, complexity level. So, um, yeah, I think the, the scaffolding is definitely one key answer, and also looking for the simpler, probably, projects that don't involve complicated vocabulary in your target language. Okay, I'm going mm -hmm. to jump in and follow up on, on the thread that you're establishing here. So, one way of adjusting a project idea so that it's suitable for the novice level 
could involve uh, less specialized knowledge, uh, yes. like say knowledge about the law and so forth, and could be say more artistic, creative. Uh, we have mm -hmm. one example project where students created storybooks for native speaking children in the language that they were studying and a storybook is maybe more suitable to the novice level because uh, it's uh, sort of more personal, simpler language, more concrete. Um, there's, uh, so I think I'll leave that, the question of uh, PBLL at the novice level there and ask you one more thing, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, assessment worked during the course of your project? Was there peer feedback of the kind that we saw in uh, the projects that Bob was showing us, the fishbowl protocol, the, the critical, you know, peer critiquing? So, for example, with the with the interviews, well, in in um, for just to give an example, during the interviews, what they did is they prepared first the interviews and they practiced with their peers. And one of the the um, the requirements was that they had to because we are in a co-teaching mode, so there is a university instructor and a high school instructor. Each of the groups had to practice the interview with a, a peer and then with one of the instructors of the class before we invited the real guests so that then we could give feedback to each of the groups and we knew that they had practiced at least twice before conducting the interview. Mm -hmm. Then for example when they did the presentational uh, mode uh, activity where at the very beginning where they were narrating what they thought they thought the events had been then we they, we always give them the the rubric for the presentational mode. So the students in the beginning of the year I always have the three rubrics for the three modes of communication. And if we do a formal, I, um, um, yeah, formal assessment, we use those rubrics. Um, I don't know if that good. answers your okay. question. Okay, thank you very much. Right, um, good. So uh, let's see what else. That there's some other uh, chatter going on in the chat box. Uh, there are some questions about the duration, the amount of time that one needs to use for a project. I'm going to jump in on that one. Um, there's a mm -hmm. tremendous number of, a tremendous amount of variability in the scope of projects. You can design uh, a smaller project or you can design one single project that might occupy the entire semester. Now, of course, all of that depends on responding to the requirements in your school, your district, uh, you know, trying to meet standards and so forth. If you are a beginning practitioner, it's probably a good idea to introduce a small scale, short term project into your regular curriculum instead of trying to make the switch, uh, you know, whole hog at from the very beginning. Uh, so there is no single answer. It's all a question of design and how much time you can afford to dedicate to the project. Uh, and there, there's no real exact recipe for, uh, you know, scaling those things. So no easy answer there. And if I, if, if I can, yeah, if I can add to that, for example, this year in our bridge class, which is a year long class, we had in the beginning of the year planned for two PBLLs to take place. And as the year progressed, we decided that only we will implement one because it, it was a project that grew and grew. So um, uh, we decided that uh, actually the two of the projects were producing your Hawaii Institute in the summer great projects, but they, we, they grew and grew, so we decided that we are postponing one of them for next year. So I think once you start, you have to be flexible with the, with the time. And for example, ours last year was five weeks, but this one this year is, um, it, is taking longer, but it's very engaging. So we're very happy with it. It sounds like the students' time was in a very worthwhile way that they were very involved and motivated. There was an additional yeah. question yeah. about student voice and choice. Uh, uh -huh. There's uh, one of our uh, attendees today 
had a, had attended a professional learning event regarding project-based learning and it was sort of pounded into them there that the students need to have voice and choice with regard to how they choose to present the final product uh, I don't I think that there's probably some debate on that. The first thing to remember is there is no perfect PBL. There's no one project that's going to hit all the marks 100%. And so while you can strive to have student voice and choice, that doesn't mean that you will succeed in giving the students that opportunity at every single juncture. After all, you do have to create some kind of structure for them to conduct a project in. Um, but the most important thing is that the project have some element of student voice and choice in it, the, that the students can choose their own direction uh, in some important respects. But as far as the mode of student presentation of the final product, I would think that it would be important for everyone to agree on format so that student products are comparable. Uh, otherwise, you would end up trying to compare a video presentation with a trifold and uh, it, it wouldn't it might not be uh, very useful um, so uh, some student voice and choice but not necessarily in the mode of presenting the final product uh, there some people are well, they, wondering they, how they, long, that, oh, go ahead Sorry. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say that, for example, for us, the, one of the, the final products was the, the art proposal. But as you saw, they had very different ideas of how to present it. So they were completely free. They did research on the Hispanic symbols and how to incorporate them. So I think that was a, a way of you. You gave them this, the, the generals of, that they had to do an art proposal, but then they were very free to choose how they were going to do it. So, yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much. This presentation has been fascinating. We have another full uh, session tomorrow, and I hope everyone will come back. We will see another example of uh, PBLL design in action uh, from a teacher from uh, Nevada. Uh, right now, please do take a moment to look in the chat and look for the link to the survey on session two on uh, Chantal and Lucia's presentation and give us some feedback. And we will look forward to seeing you same time, same ch channel tomorrow for one more uh, project example and then a presentation on how you can continue your professional learning in the area of project-based language learning.